Hello. Thank you very much once again for coming tonight. It's a blessing to uh, be able to be with you and to share the word of God, as David has already mentioned. I'd just like to read uh, a few verses with you in the Old Testament, and I'd like to uh, tell you right from the beginning what it is that I'd like to speak about. I'd like to tell you about a person that has been prophesied for many thousands of years, who has already come to the earth and who will come back to the earth. And this person is going to bring perfection. He's going to bring a new government. He will bring peace to the world. But before he can do that, there was something that he had to do that is very important. And that is the thing that I want to tell you about tonight. What it is that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you personally with respect to personal salvation. And as I mentioned, it, it, the only way that I can tell you about that is to put it in context for you within the Bible, within the scriptures, and beginning right at the beginning and going all the way to the end. I'd like you to think about the gospel, and I'd like you to think about salvation. I'd like you to think about the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, but I want to put him in perspective for you, and especially these days of trouble and anarchy and sickness and all the things that are going on in the world. I trust that this message will hit home to you uh, today even in September of 2020. So allow me just to read a few verses in the Old Testament, and then we'll begin. The book of Isaiah is an old book, and it's a book that was written by a man named Isaiah. who was a prophet, and he said many things, but of the many things that he said about different events that will happen that have happened in the past already, others that will happen in the future, one of the main things that he talks about is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said this through prophecy because he didn't see him. He wasn't there. Uh, he wasn't an eyewitness uh, to the Lord Jesus' life or to his death or to his ascension or anything that happened in his life. But the, uh, God himself gave him these revelations in order that he might tell us, written in the word of God, that we might read them and we might understand exactly what they were thinking and also what to look for in the future. So let me read just a few of the ones that he gave us, a few of the prophecies that he gave about the Lord Jesus. One of them comes in Isaiah chapter 7. And if you have your Bible... You can turn to Isaiah chapter 7 and verse number 13, and it would say this. And he said, Hear you now, house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. I'd like to read another one. This is in chapter 9. Again, this is the same author, but he is speaking about the same person, the Lord Jesus Christ, for those of you who are not as familiar with the Bible, the book of Isaiah, again, is speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ from a prophetic perspective. He had not seen him. He's talking about the future. And in chapter 9, he talks about, once again, talks about his birth. But now he gives more information, not just the fact that he would be born in perfection, as we saw in chapter number 7. The fact that he would be born of a virgin, born miraculously. But now he tells us more about the person who was born. And it says this in chapter 9. He says, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth and even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Again, now, as we come to chapter 9, he's telling us what this person will do, not just his beginning, not just the perfection in his birth, but now he says, this is what this man is going to do. And I wonder if you noticed, if you picked up that word, especially the word right in the middle, the prince, that title, prince of peace, the peace that he will bring. It said this specifically, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And that is one of the things I'd like to emphasize to you about him tonight. He has come to bring peace. And that is a personal peace that you can have in your own life, in your own soul, between yourself and God. But the Lord Jesus Christ will also come one day. And I'd like to mention this as well. He will bring peace to the world, peace to the earth, peace even to this globe that we see today. Once again, full of war and full of fighting and full of conflict. He will bring true peace between people, but also for the entire planet, for every single human being that lives here. I'll expand on these things in a little bit, but I just wanted to read a few of these verses as an introduction, and we'll go ahead and read a few more. In Isaiah 42, you can turn there if you have your Bible. Isaiah 42, we read another aspect of this person. 
And as we go through the book of Isaiah, you learn more and more and more about the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a few books in the Bible that will talk about him in this way. And you find them in the Old Testament. And this is one of the amazing things about the Bible. For those of you who aren't Christians, I would commend to you the reading of the Bible by itself. You will not understand everything right away. But I would like to uh, encourage you to read the Bible as it is a miraculous book. This book, written roughly 700 years before the Lord Jesus Christ ever came to the world, this prophet was able to predict, and not just predict, that is too soft of a word. He was able to prophesy precisely who he was and what he would do. And he could even tell us details about his life and about his death and about his coming again to the world. And as we read these prophecies 700 years before he came, you can compare them with actual history, true history about the Lord Jesus Christ, an actual historical man who came to the world in AD 33 and who died and died specifically the way that Isaiah said he was going to die. And Isaiah was not the only person to speak in this way. You read about this in the book of the Psalms. You read about this in other prophets like Micah and Zechariah and Jeremiah and all these other men in the Old Testament who speak about the Lord Jesus Christ in one way or another, about his life, about his death, about the future, about when he will come back. And as you read through, even from beginning to end, I trust that you will even be amazed to see the accuracy of the Bible and the truth of this book, a rock you can stand on, truth that you can base your life on and from now even until the lord takes you home where was i now i was thinking of isaiah 42 and uh before we get too caught up in all these details i do want to mention isaiah 42 to, to give you another aspect of his life we've thought about his birth we've thought about uh this aspect of his his kingdom it shall be a kingdom of peace he's bringing peace but now in isaiah 42 he's going to tell us a little bit about his his personality if i could say it that way he speaks to us about his character, and he says this in Isaiah 42. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, and he's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ here, my chosen, whom my soul delights, I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. And then he says this, and just think, as you listen to these verses, if you don't have a Bible, just listen, and contrast, compare in your mind the character of the man who is about to be described and the politicians that you see around you and, and whatever party it is. We're not uh, we're not promoting any party here today or any of the candidates for the election, upcoming election in, in this country. Any politician you can ever think of in the entire world, compare them to what you're about to hear. This man, it says about him, he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the streets, in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Then speaking to us about the character of the Lord Jesus Christ, meek, humble, mild, not somebody who is weak, but somebody who will come and who will come confident, but who will come in peace, and he will come in humility. And with this humble righteousness that he will bring as he comes back to the earth, he will bring true peace. Once again, not just personally, but also globally for everyone here on the earth who believes in him. I want to read another one and in the same book of Isaiah. And as I'm going through the book of Isaiah, what I'm doing is I'm showing you how Isaiah is giving a complete picture of who the Lord Jesus Christ is and of what he is going to do. Who the Lord Jesus Christ is and of what he has done and is going to do in a future day. And Isaiah 53, if you have your Bible, again, turn to Isaiah 53. And if you don't have it, I'm going to read it and, and listen very carefully. But he says this now about his death. We've heard about his birth. We've heard about his, his, his peace that he's going to bring, his character. But then Isaiah wants to tell us about the way he would die. Not many people we read about, uh, not many people in, in history, not many people have had their deaths predicted. A lot of people might be able to say, well, I think he will die of this or that sickness, etc." But the, the precision with which Isaiah is speaking about his death is nothing less than a divine revelation given to him prior to the actual occurrence. So read, listen very carefully to what he says. Isaiah 53 and verse 4 says this. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, 
smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Isaiah, uh, the, the prophet Isaiah here is speaking about what we know of now as the crucifixion. And he is describing to us precisely what happened for him 700 years later, but for us 2000 years ago, when the Lord Jesus Christ died at Calvary on that cross, God revealed to him specifically what would happen. And we can look backwards and, and check this and compare this with what truly happened. And it is all the same. It is exactly what was foretold. What God revealed to Isaiah was exactly what came true. And there's just one more that I wanted to read with you because I want to emphasize this to you again. This is the final one that we find in the book of Isaiah. Not the last one, but one of the last ones. Chapter number 61. If you have your Bible, turn to Isaiah 61. And I know I'm turning to a lot of passages, but I, I did want to impress this upon you. That the Bible is a book that gives a complete picture of history and a complete picture of the future. And it gives a complete picture of your life. And as you read the Bible, and as you get more acquainted with the, the gospel and the message of truth that we are presenting to you tonight, the more you will become impressed how well God knows, how well God knows you, how well God knows history, and how well God knows all of the future as well. It says this in Isaiah 61, and I'm just going to read it for you. It says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. These are beautiful words. Listen, listen to this. The garment of praise instead of a faint spirit that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified, and they shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. And I just, I, I flew through, I'm flying through the book of Isaiah once again, because I want to give you a comprehensive picture of what God is doing with respect to the work of salvation. And as we think about these prophecies, they're, they're all throughout the Bible. And I could speak to you about other prophecies in the book right from the beginning in the book of Genesis. And I'll come back to Isaiah in a moment uh, for the meat of the message tonight. But just let me mention very quickly, in the book of Genesis, we find uh, one of the earliest prophecies. You find patterns in the Bible that are, that are repeated all throughout the rest of Scripture. Right at the beginning, you find a prophecy uh, that was for us about 6,000 years old, but when it was, uh, when it came to uh, fruition, it was actually about 4,000 years old. Imagine that 4,000 years ago, somebody telling us that something will happen 4,000 years ago. And then 4,000 years later, it actually comes true. It says this in Genesis 3 15, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And this actually happened. This happened once again in AD 33 in that city of Jerusalem over in uh, present day Israel, where the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, when he died, what he did there was he defeated the one who had the power of death, which is Satan. Hebrews chapter two tells us. And this prophecy came true 4000 years later. We wait, another prophecy around uh, in a similar time frame in a similar uh, close to the time of Genesis. We're not exactly sure how old the book of Job is. But he speaks about resurrection and he says in Job 9, 19, 25, for I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. Another prophecy, thinking about the earth, thinking about the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will come back to the earth. And this man, 4,000 years before it actually happened, he prophesied and it came true. I'll just mention, I'll just mention two more. And again, what I'm doing by reading these verses is for those of you who are not saved, for those of you who not do, do not believe the Lord Jesus Christ. These are serious things. This is a serious book. This isn't just another religion. Uh, we aren't gurus. Uh, we aren't people who are uh, life coaches. Uh, this isn't therapy for all the benefit that might be in therapy. We're not a counselor. Counselors can be very helpful, but this is not what we're doing tonight. This isn't, uh, we're not coming alongside to give you a pep talk. This is truth. 
And this is divine revelation that has come down. We have received over 6,000 years old. God has progressively revealed these truths to people who have lived on this earth. And you are the benefactor today. You can receive this truth and live your life based on this truth and know that it is true. Another one in Deuteronomy chapter number 18, it says this, verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. He's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And once again, 4,000 years, roughly speaking, he uh, later he came, or for him, he was 1,500 years before the Lord Jesus Christ came. Last one I'll read to you, and then we'll get back to Isaiah, and I'll explain to you what I have in mind tonight. Second Samuel 7, verse 12 and verse 13. I will raise up for you an offspring after you who shall come from your body, speaking to David, and I will establish his kingdom. He's going to come from his body, he said. He was speaking to a man who was the king, King David, and he said, one of your descendants is going to be a king. And he says this, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne, the throne of his kingdom forever. Just like the first three came true. And just like everything we read in Isaiah came true, so did this come true. And as you Read in, in the New Testament. One of the things you'll find out, and once again, I encourage you to read, starting with the New Testament, you can begin with a book like Mark. As you read these books, you will notice, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, the name Son of David, Son of David, Son of David. In fact, the Gospel starts this way, telling us about his genealogy, how the Lord Jesus Christ came from the line of David. Why? Because it is a fulfillment of prophecy. Prophesied a thousand years before he came. Now David thinking of, or the Lord saying to David, thinking of the one who would come from his own family and the Lord Jesus Christ from the same family as David. He came from his body, as it were, and he came to reign and he will come again. So all the things that I have read to you in the book of Isaiah, these are not just predictions. These are not, uh, these are not polls as we've been hearing about uh, today and uh, in the past few weeks, and in fact, all year long about the election. And these are not projections about what might happen in the future. These are prophecies divine revelations about a future day when these things will actually come true. And what I'd like to emphasize in a personal way for you tonight is that if you were to bank your life, rest your entire life on the truth that is found in the word of God, you will never waver. You will be found to be in the right. You will be saved. You will be rescued. The Bible tells us uh, through many different words that it uses to ex uh, explain the work of salvation. The Bible says that you can be forgiven from your sins by the person I've mentioned. The Bible says you can be justified. You can be in the right before God, again, because of the work of the person that I've already mentioned. The Bible says you can be reconciled to God. You can enjoy uh, a new relationship with God. The Bible says you can be adopted by God himself. You can go from being a slave to sin to being a son in God's family. The Bible says you can have a brand new life. Regeneration is the Bible word. He will give you a totally, entirely brand new life so that you can live for God. And all of these things will come for free and through the person that I want to speak to you about again tonight. So let's go back to Isaiah. And as I begin and once again go through the verses that I've already mentioned, what I want to do now, I'm not just going to read them all again, but what I'd like to do with the rest of the message is I'd like to relate them to your life and relate them to their fulfillment in the New Testament. So if you're confused at this point, let me just state this one more time. We're in the book of Isaiah. And the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, sometimes called a mini Bible, is a book that gives us a comprehensive, a complete picture of all the work of salvation from beginning to end, and focusing on the person who will bring this salvation. Beginning with his birth in chapter 9, what we learn is this. He will have a perfect birth. What that tells us is that the person who will come to be this savior, the savior for you and the savior for all the world, he will be a man who was born of God. That is to say that he will be a perfect man. We know from the New Testament and we know from other passages that this was a man that existed in eternity. And what that means is that he existed before the world even began. In fact, we learn in the book of Hebrews that the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who Isaiah is speaking about, was the man who God used to create this entire world. And what we also learned from the Gospel of John is that he wasn't just a man. He wasn't just some man that God used. In fact, he was God himself. So what we're learning about the Lord Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 9 is the beginning of his life on earth. Not the beginning of his existence, but the beginning of his life on this earth. And what he says to us in this, in, in 9 and even in chapter 7, is that he will be born 
of a virgin. And then he says this, you will bear a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel. You know, it's very interesting because as we come to uh, the, the New Testament and the Gospel of Matthew, and you read right in the first chapter, what you find is that this came true. And you have a man named Joseph, and he had a wife named Mary, and an angel appears to him. And he appeared to him in a dream. And as he appeared in this dream, he said, he said to him this, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. This is, gonna, this is a perfect man. This is, this is the work of God, the angel said to Joseph. And then he said, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why would you call him that, you should ask? And the angel explained, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, what we already read in Isaiah 7, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Do you know anybody like this? Just think for a few seconds. We, we have a few minutes here. Think, think for a few seconds. Do you know any ruler on earth? It could be a president. It could be a prime minister. It could be, it could even be a dictator. <laughs> We're going to consider all the different rulers. Do you, do you know anyone in the world who was born in this way? There's only one man in history who was ever born this way. And it was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That man you hear spoken about as Jesus. That man you hear spoken about as that Jewish teacher. That man who taught so many people over in Israel and maybe is the person who Christians worship. And he's that man who maybe you've heard of the Sermon on the Mount. And he says that you should love your neighbor. And he says that you should do good things and do good unto others. And, and, and et cetera, et cetera. People that, that speak about him as if he were just a teacher. Again, as if he were just a counselor. The Bible says this. He was a perfect man. Born of the Holy Spirit. Born in perfection. And what we learn is that this man who will bring peace to the earth. He had perfect peace himself. And he was perfect himself. I'd like to tell you tonight that there's no one else that I would like to come back to be the ruler of this world. There's no president, no candidate. There's no person, no politician in the world who could ever compare with him. And the Bible tells us this. This is the kind of man who will come back. But he says more in chapter nine. I want to emphasize this. These ones aren't so much uh, mentioned in the New Testament in the same way that the other ones are. But I did want to mention this. It says that he will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God the everlasting father and this beautiful title, the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Peace. Now, if you watch the news at all, and I try not to watch it too much, you might have noticed that there's a lot of anarchy in the country today. There are riots. There are people who are looting. And this isn't happening everywhere, but we know it is happening in certain places. There's unrest. People aren't happy. All sorts of social issues all sorts of economic issues, all sorts of health issues. And as we find in, in recent days, and uh, again, looking at the news in the last few days, you find even the politicians, and this isn't too, too abnormal, but the politicians are at each other's throats and they're threatening to do this and they're threatening to do the other thing. And they're all looking for different ways to get behind the other person's back. And they're all trying to use different tactics to make sure that they win. And I'm gonna make sure that my platform wins. And I'm going to make sure that my form of politics and my, my policies get through. And I'm going to make sure that everyone in the country is doing things the way that I want them to be done. And I will fight and I will uh, hurt other people and I will stomp on other people and I will make sure that this happens. I don't care who gets in my way. What a contrast to this man. What a contrast. What the Bible tells us is that a man will come. He will not come and he will not be stepping on people's toes, as it were. He's not going to be going to be coming and using politics and using manipulative words to uh, change people's minds. He's not going to be coming. There will be no ads on the television screen trying to get you to believe him. There will be no smear campaigns about other people uh, to make sure that you don't look and vote for another ruler. It says that he will be the prince of peace. And it says this about his government. Many of you thinking about government. Six more weeks till the next election. Well, listen to this government. This, isn't a, this, this is no political party here on earth today. This is coming directly from heaven. It says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. There shall be no end. It's an amazing thought. But as we think about this peace that will come, we have to think about another point. How exactly will we get there? 
how will we get to this point when this great prince will come, the prince of peace, the everlasting father, mighty God, the wonderful counselor, the one as we read also in chapter a number number 11, the spirit of the Lord will rest on this man. He will have the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge. He will have the fear of the Lord. It says that he will uh, rule with righteousness. He will judge the poor. He will reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. He will smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. And faithfulness, the girdle of his, of his reins. How is this going to happen? When will we ever see this on the earth? I long for this. I hope you long for this today. I hope you're hoping for a world when, in which we will have perfect peace. Well, the Bible describes to us exactly the way that this will happen. And we have to go all the way to chapter number 53. Go back to number 53 to find out how this happens. It's not going to happen in a way that you might think. Sometimes when we think about world peace, we think of diplomacy. And you've seen in the last few days, and again, if you if you read the news, and the reason why I mentioned the, the news so much is because Isaiah is speaking to us about national, uh, uh, not just national, global issues. And if you've looked at the news in the last few days, you'll, re you, you'll notice that uh, our president has been over in, in other countries and brokering peace uh, over in, uh, in, the Balt in the Baltic regions. And he's been brokering peace over in the Middle East. And he's been uh, trying to, to see peace in different parts of the world. And, and surely other people are trying to do the same here in our own country. People trying to affect peace between different parties, people that have been at odds for many, many years. And you say, how do these things happen? Well, many times they happen through diplomacy. And people will not negotiate. I'll give this much if you give that much. I'll do this if you do that. And if we can agree on this, then we'll, give a, we'll get a handshake at the end and we'll have some sort of peace. And what they mean by this peace is that we won't be fighting anymore. Well, that's not how the Bible describes it. The Bible, in fact, says it this way. That the only way that there will be peace, the only way that there will be peace is through a death. And that death is the death of the man that I've already mentioned in chapter 9, in chapter 7, in chapter 11, in chapter 42. The one who was prophesied in 2 Samuel, as we read, in Deuteronomy, in Genesis, in Job, in all these different prophecies that we have thought of. That man who was prophesied to come, the great ruler, the prince of peace, the king of all the earth who will come. He will bring peace to the entire earth. That's the man who Isaiah also says. He also says about him. Before he ever does any of those things. One thing he must do. Is he must die. He must die. There's a little phrase there. And in thinking about the word peace. It's in verse number five. If you have your Bible open. You can turn to it. But if not, I'll read it. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. True peace. Personal peace between you and God. And before he will ever come and give global peace, the Bible says this. There is one thing that he must do. He must bring us peace as individuals. Between us and God, Ephesians 2 describes us as enemies of God. We that were far away were brought near. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. But because of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, he brought us peace because of what he did at Calvary. He has brought us peace. And now he offers it to you. And every single person who is listening tonight, you can have personal peace. This peace between you, you yourself, and God. A peace that will last forever and a peace that comes from the one who will come in a coming day very soon. And he will bring global peace for every single person who looks to him. But how exactly does this happen? How exactly will he do this? Well, the way in which he will bring personal peace to you were the words that we read right before that. He said in verse number four, he's borne our griefs, he carried our griefs, he carried our sorrows. But we esteemed him stricken. We thought he was just uh, some person who was being judged by God, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. Think about it this way. What good? Imagine one of these candidates here in the United States today, six weeks to the next election. Imagine one of them. Imagine they were able to bring perfect peace to this country and even to the entire world. 
but they couldn't change any of the people inside the world. All they could do was bring a new platform, a new administration, new policy, new laws. Would that be any good? I would suggest to you that that wouldn't be any good because he wouldn't be able to change any of the people. The only thing that would happen from one of those two candidates is that they would have to punish everyone. If a perfect man were to come and to bring his government today and he were to have a perfect administration and try to bring perfect peace, the perfect laws and, and all the rest of it, he would have to judge every single person in this country, including me and including you. So in order for God to bring perfect peace, he must not only bring peace, a perfect administration through Christ, but he also must change the actual people. And that means you. That, mean, that meant me when I was saved. I, I was saved when I was nine years old. He had to change me, change my heart, forgive my sins, give me a brand new life, redeem me from my slavery to sin, reconcile me to him so that I can be part of his family once again, adopt him in to become a son of God. This had to happen to me, and it is open, it is available to happen to every single one of you. Why? Because he has come and he has dealt with the biggest problem in your life that has been separating you from God, and that is your sin. Before he can ever bring world peace, he must bring personal peace. Before he can ever bring a perfect administration, he must bring a make a personal change in your life. He cannot just come and bring a new government. He must come and actually change the people, change the subjects, change the actual people who live in this world, and that means you. You and your sin must be dealt with. Your issue, your heart problem must be dealt with. And what Isaiah tells us before we get to chapter 61, and I'll get there to finish, he tells us that this happened in AD 33, 2,000 years ago. When the Lord Jesus Christ died at Calvary, what he was doing there was God was punishing him for your sin. Once again, before he can bring peace to the globe, to the, to, to the entire world, he must deal with the personal issue of sin in your heart. And this is what he was doing with the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. He says, "All we, we know that all we like sheep have gone astray. But he says this, he was pierced for our transgressions. The Lord laid on him at the very end of this verse number five. And verse number six, sorry. He says this, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God laid that on him. It wasn't his own iniquity, his own sin. It wasn't his own offenses against God. It was our sin. God laid it on him so that he would pay for it, so that he could condemn sin in the flesh, as uh, another writer in the Bible calls it, so that he could pay for sin to give you and I the opportunity now to have changed hearts, changed lives, and a new reality, a new relationship with God. And having done this, and opening this up to you, now the opportunity, now the way the, the, the roadmap has been laid out, the, the access to God's presence is now being given, and also the, the route to finally, uh, 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 to finally come to the day when Christ will come to be the prince of all the world. And this is the verse that I wanted to read to you. It's in Isaiah 61. You can look at it up for yourself. Uh, Isaiah 61, and it's, it's quoted again in the New Testament. In Luke chapter 4, but it says this, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ came to do, and it's exactly what he did at Calvary. Now, I wanted to close by thinking about just one little detail here. And I have to mention this, otherwise I wouldn't have faithfully preached the gospel tonight. But there is an aspect of a consequence. There is a consequence for those of you who do not believe. And the consequence is judgment. This isn't just a, an offer that God gives to everyone in the world. And if you'd like it, you can take it. But if you don't, then carry on your own way. And you have your religion, I have mine. No, there's a consequence and there's a judgment for all those who don't believe. God is a God of love. God is a God of patience. God is a God of salvation, but he is also a righteous God. And he cannot tolerate. He cannot tolerate unrighteousness. It all must be punished. And it will. 
But he extends his hand out to you tonight. If you will have him, if you will believe on his son, the one who has dealt with sin, he will save you and bring you into this kingdom that is coming. But if you don't, the next line of the verse says this, that he has also come to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. He didn't read that verse when he was here on the earth because it wasn't the time for vengeance. But this line, the, the next line that he did not read, this will happen in a coming day, the day of vengeance. It is coming. And God will have vengeance on all sin. He will punish all sinners. And all of those, all of, all of you who are listening tonight who are not saved, you will be punished. You will suffer. You will be without God for all eternity. Why would you go that route? Why would you avoid what God is offering to you tonight? Why would you spurn God, reject him, put him to the side when he is offering to give you everything? He gave you the most precious thing in his heart, his very own son. And tonight what he wants from you is to trust him, to believe him, to receive that salvation and receive a brand new life. And it says this in verse number nine, for those who believe him, he will comfort all those who mourn. Many people mourning in our country tonight. There's many people who are sad. He says he will grant to those who mourn in Zion. He will give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. In the Bible, the Old Testament, when people mourn, they put ash on themselves. He says he'll give them a beautiful headdress instead of those ashes. Another, another translation of the Bible says it poetically, there will be beauty for ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. The garment of praise instead of a faint spirit that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They will build the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations. What, are all, what do all these things mean? What is he saying? He's saying for all those who believe him, the one who came and was born in perfection, the one who came and who told us about a perfect government that is coming, the prince of peace that has been prophesied by Isaiah, the one who died at Calvary and paid for your sin. He is the one who invites you into his kingdom, which will come in a future day. He invites you to take him by the hand, as it were, to come with him and to live with him for all eternity. All these things will come true, just as we've seen all the prophecies I mentioned. They've already come true. The majority of the prophecies we see in the Bible, they've come true. But there's many more that speak about a future day. And just as the first ones came true, the rest will. Two. Think about the Lord Jesus tonight. You lay your head on your pillow. Think about this one who has come to the earth. He's already come. God promised he would, and he is coming back. Will you be with him as one who has believed him, or will you be rejected by him as one who has spurned his offer of salvation? Let me just read this verse, these offers of salvation for you tonight uh, as I close. Whoever believes may in him have eternal life. John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death and into life. May that be you tonight. Thank you very much.